okay just give it one more minute and then we will uh, i'll start the intro anyway and then as people start to join i have the slides up i have my camera on the audio's on so greta i think i'm good to go i'm gonna actually put my phone on um airplay mode to reduce any <laughs> wi-fi disruption <laughs> Okay, well, I will make a start. So um, as people start to join the session, um, they can they can pick up where we're at. And this bit will just be for the intro. So uh, you may have met me. Um, I did a session on um, resilience, remote working type approach back. Oh, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was probably only last month in April, um, although we are at the end of May now. So my name is Ruth Cooper Dixon. I am the founder and the managing director of a global people and mental wealth consultancy called Champs. We're based in London um, in the UK, uh, but we work across the world globally. We have lots of clients that we work globally with, and um, we generally work with large, large global corporates. Um, but it was a pleasure to kind of um, interact with Megan through uh, um, through your ambassador, Sheru, and um, we ended up connecting and, and me doing a session for you guys last uh, last month and obviously wanted to, to kind of do something else. So here we are with Positive Psychology 101, which was a session that I put to Megan as an idea. Um, you may have probably seen there's been a lot um, with regards to the pandemic about positive psychology. It seems to have kind of had a bit of a... Um, a bit of a what's the word I'm looking for a kind of an, an upstart in the media really because people are pulling on these some of these tools and techniques now which is great um positive psychology has been around for some time but I will talk you all through that so um yeah so it's an absolute pleasure to be delivering this session for you and we've got an hour together but I will leave some time for questions um but I prefer sessions to be hugely interactive um so there's lots of opportunity for you to um get involved on this as well like the other sessions that I've delivered the other session I delivered if you were on that um I think as well, what I love about positive psychology, um, so if I probably give you a bit of an understanding in the sense of my background, so I completed my MSc at the University of East London at the end of, uh, beginning of this year of 2020 in applied positive, um, applied positive uh, psychology and coaching psychology. And um, University of East London was the second place in the world after Penn University in the US, which is where positive psychology was originally founded as a, um, a course. And as University of East London was the second place to, um, to do it. And they were the first to combine both positive psychology and coaching psychology as, um, as an MSc. And for me, it was a case of um, realizing that throughout my own recovery of mental ill health, which I am now in my fifth year, and it is actually the reason why I set up Shams, I was diagnosed with two anxiety disorders, panic disorder and generalized anxiety disorder, having had a um, gone through burnout and a breakdown. I realized that actually lots of what I had experienced um, and ways that I dealt with um, kind of life and moving forwards was founded in positive psychology principles. And for me, it was this great big realization. So when I came across, I think you know, I'm a big believer of these things happen for a reason. Um, and I came across this course and I thought, wow, this is this is what I want to do. And um, it gives us as a business a really different lens to looking at um, psychology and in particular uh, mental health and mental ill health as well as well-being and, and all the other facets around that. So I hope you find this session interesting because what it will perhaps do is if you are interested in this stuff, if it's something that kind of um, 
I, I guess touches um, a nerve with you it gives you an opportunity to go out there and read more and explore more and find out more which I always think is um, a catalyst for change in itself but also for our own well-being and what I think is very important from the work that you do as an organization it is heavily driven um, you know any charitable work is is heavily driven by meaning and purpose which is a big part of uh, positive psychology as you'll get to see so maybe it might make sense to you when you start to reflect a little bit more about why why you do the work you do why you work in the, the organization you work for um, it's not just focused on ourselves what I love about positive psychology as well is that it focuses on um, the institutions the collective that we sit within the communities etc so Hopefully this will be of interest and it will kind of guide you through um, kind of understand a little bit more about positive psychology. So first off, what I want to, to kind of go through is the journey we're going to have together in the next hour. We are going to look at what it means to have the good life. We are going to look at um, what's known as the mental wealth continuum. We're going to talk about authentic happiness. We're going to talk about positive emotions. Uh, we're going to look at clean and well-being. And that isn't, that's not hygiene <laughs> in terms of clean. And we're going to finish off with character strengths and positive psychology um, interventions. Uh, so I'm going to give you a couple of ideas of, of things you can take away. But all the way through this, I think there is an option for you to kind of delve a little deeper. And please do ask any questions, just drop them into the chat. I'm driving the chat. So I will uh, I will see anything that comes through. So when I first um, did this, put this together, if you like, but, you know, designed it, it was really funny because if you've ever seen the classic movie, The Matrix, it feels very old now, very dated, but The Matrix and Keanu Reeves, Neo is offered the red pill or the blue pill. And I kind of feel like positive psychology is a little bit like that because the blue pill was obviously the one which kept you kept in the matrix and you weren't aware of anything. You kind of went on your life as normal and that was all well and good. But the red pill was kind of... Um, you were freed, so you were given your freedom from the matrix and you were given that um, that freedom to, to get away at the, and to live your life. But also with that becomes, I, I guess, the, the truth and the honesty and the rawness and the vulnerability and everything else that happens alongside that. And I personally feel that's what positive psychology has done for me is that Yes, I have great tools and ability to see things very differently. And hopefully even this session will just give you a little widening of those lenses and removing some of those blinkers. But it's also I described it in an article I wrote at the weekend on Friday, actually, which is kind of like you, you can feel the glorious technicolor of life and you see that. But the dark is perhaps so much more painful in lots of ways because that's also part of positive psychology we're not all about rainbows and <laughs> unicorns unfortunately we don't go around feeling wonderfully happy all the time and that's what I love about positive psychology as well there's often a misconception that positive psychology is everybody feeling happy and wonderful which would be great if life was like that but as we're finding out right now and I'm sure in the work that you do that life is not like that for many people so it's a science. It's based on evidence-based research. It's not self-help. It's um, it's scientific-based. It's based on studies. And that is what I love about it as well, because you're only as good as the data you have. And we, I see lots of people who are coaches and people who have various things they're peddling, but actually it's not founded on any kind of um, substantial evidence. And that's not to say that what you, uh, what you do for you makes you feel well if there's no kind of rhyme or reason, I'm a big crystal person. Um, but that's, you know, there's some evidence there, some not so great, um, but it makes me feel good. So why, what, you know, why not? But I think when we start to look at actually delving into kind of the psychology side, it's good to have that evidence. So this is what we're going to cover in the next, um, the next 50 minutes or so. But first off, I just want to create a little poll um, because it's always good to have a check in um, to see how you are doing. So I think this will work if I hit preview. How's everyone feeling right now? How are you feeling today? Are you 10 out of 10? You're great. Are you seven to nine? I'm good. Are you 
four to six, I'm okay, or less than three, it's one of those days. And in fact, if I hit publish, I think that will work. There you go. So if you want to just check in with yourself, because that's a big part of positive psychology, it's being able to tap in and go, where am I at today? With a non-judgmental lens. Um, if you're feeling crappy, that's, that's also okay. If you're feeling amazing, that's also okay. But it's just good to have a little sense check. Okay, we've done. So let's just see this. So there you go. You should be able to see that. Most of you are kind of in the seven to seven to four category. So I'm good or I'm okay. Wonderful. Well, that's good to know. Um, so let's hope we can maybe lift some of those nines into a 10 or if you're four to six, maybe we can move you up maybe to four and a half or a five. Um, and this is what I love about positive psychology interventions, which we're going to look at, is that they're really small and simple. And the idea is you're not going to make huge, big sweeping changes in your life um, straight off. It's always about micro steps. It's always about um, just checking in with yourself, seeing how you're feeling, um, which changes, as I'm sure you're aware, day to day at the moment. Um, I'm I'm kind of a seven to nine as well, actually. I had three days off, which is the first time I've had that amount of time off since probably the beginning of March, if not the end of February. Um, so yeah, I totally hear you on the, the seven to nine today. Maybe, maybe that helped for me. So let's start then. So what is the good life? I, I love this quote by um, Aristotle, which is happiness is a state of activity. And this is what I meant before about um, positive psychology is not about being happy all of the time, because you all know happiness tends to be a fleeting emotion. It's an emotion we can experience um we don't necessarily feel happy as that emotion as we kind of know it constantly. It doesn't, you know, it, it, it kind of fits in with other emotions and, and often it can be very fleeting. Positive psychology has been around for, um, you know, for a long time. Uh, it wasn't called that. But if we look at the works of Aristotle, who is a big, I guess, positive psychologist, a grandfather of positive psychology. If we look at Socrates, Plato, all of that kind of work was very much about um, when people pursued a virtuous life, they would become authentically happy. And that's a big that's a big part of it is when it means to be authentically happy. Um, the, there's kind of two sides to to happiness and to well-being. One is kind of the um, the hedonist uh, hedonistic approach to happiness and well-being. And then there's eudaimonia. And with the hedonist approach, I mean, you're probably familiar with hearing the word, they're a hedonist or they're a hedonist, um, depending on how you, how you pronounce that. But that approach of always wanting the good life, always looking for the next, you know, amazing experience, the next um the next high and if if we think of people who are those people who really want to experience more highs in their life than lows you know they want to keep those highs higher and their lows as, as limited as possible and we can often get into what's called um the hedonistic treadmill and I love that I, just, I love that thought because it applies so much to our society um, in this current day where you're on a treadmill and I see it a lot working with people in the city and it, you know my career prior to having my breakdown I worked in investment banking and wealth management and aerospace and worked in big corporates and it was always about the next the next thing so it's the next promotion and you're on this almost this treadmill of when I get to this salary when I get to this level and then it's when I get this house and when I get this car and when I get this partner and there's a there's a, all of the subjects I'm going to talk about in the next um so the next 45 minutes or so the, these are all subjects in themselves you know you could do a, you know a whole session on happiness and on what it means to be authentically happy and and really get into that because there's a myth you know I'll be happy when um, there's actually evidence-based research that actually many people go into crisis because they're waiting for that ultimate point of when they think they're going to be happy and they get there and it's not what they anticipated or 
they kind of think, well, what's next? Um, you know, if you, it, it's kind of almost a, a void. So it, it creates lots of cri burnout crisis, but also lots of existential crises in people. And um, we tend to see that a lot more as well in kind of midlife. Um, so this whole approach to being happy and what that means and uh, eudaimonia is much more deeper than that. It's about thinking um more collectively about, you know, what makes us authentically happy, the meaning and purpose we we kind of um, prescribe to in life. So positive psychology looks at the past. It looks at it looks at kind of well-being. It looks at which, which we're going to, to focus on as a subject because well-being and, and positive psychology are, are different. So we're going to talk about well-being as well. Contentment and satisfaction. So what's really interesting is there's a... Uh, there's a, a researcher who I'm not including in this session called um, Sonia Lubomowski, who's wrote a number of books on happiness. And uh, she came up with um, what's kind of like the happiness or the happiness formula, which is when you are satisfied with life and you're content and you have positive emotions. It kind of equals some sense of happiness. Um, so how many people do actually sit there and think I feel content and I feel satisfied, which means there's a lot about being present. If you've ever come across any of Eckhart Tolle's work, um, his books, his, you know, his his own podcast where he's been on other podcasts, he's done a, a lot of work about the, you know, the power of now and being in the moment. Um, flow is is something which is a big part of positive psychology, that feeling of being in flow. And I love that because for me, I'm a runner. Um, and I've run marathons and people often say when you're training, like, I can't, I can't believe you'd be, you know, don't you get bored? But when I train for a long run, the first 45 minutes, my body's kind of getting into it and my, my breathing and my body's kind of warming up. And then sometimes an hour can go by and I don't really realize that. <laughs> I don't really remember. Sometimes I don't even really recall lots around me I'll just be in that moment and I'll just experience in that so maybe for you um you you experience in that with your work you might be um in fact let me ask you when do you think you might feel like you're in flow and if there's any creative people on here you might be able to recognize that but when do you think you might personally feel like you're in flow just drop in the chat is there anything that you can kind of think of where you actually know the time can pass sometimes and you but you just your body your brain it's it feels like it's all in in one together any ideas painting yes i've got a good friend who's a painter who um is like that Yoga, definitely. Yoga is a part of positive psychology. You will not be surprised by that, I'm sure. Yoga is about, was designed for the, the mind, body and spirit, not as a fitness exercise. Walking in nature, most definitely, Sophie. Teaching, making music, yes. Sewing, cooking, yeah. So you get it, right? You know what I'm talking about. You're not just checking that you're not, not making, you're not thinking, what on earth is she talking about? Yeah, sports in general. Yeah, you're in flow, right? Your head's in the game, Simon. I love that. If you're playing football, like, you know, you're not, you know, when you're not having a good game. And I know when I'm not having a good run, but sometimes I also know when I'm thinking things through, I can be in flow. So that's, that's being present. Okay, making coffee. <laughs> Megan, I love that idea. Uh, yeah, it's your little ritual, right? Uh, I have morning routines where I'm in my my flow, um, and yoga's a part of that. And also, we look at f the future with positive psychology. So we look at optimism and hope. Um, I did a whole session on this subject for a client a few weeks ago, and you know, there's almost, I guess, with the work that you do, it's about how you create that optimism and hope for people in very difficult tough situations and working with the volunteers that you do. Um, but also thinking about, um, you know, at the moment, just generally, people have really, you know, ho how we look for that optimism and hope and what that actually means. I think what's really important is to, to think about as well is that, you um, 
you know, there's this element of the dark side of positive psychology, which is nothing to do with, you know, Star Wars or anything like that. But it's kind of this is my area of expertise, which is the, you know, the the side around death and spirituality and post what's called post-traumatic growth and moving through difficult times and moving through adversity and trauma and all of that stuff. And that's been a, a more recent wave. Um, positive psychology was founded in 1998 as a particular discipline. Um, so there's been two decades worth of research. I mean, there are obviously studies that have gone back further, which we're able to pull on, but there's an actual founding, um, a founding uh, area of special uh, speciality. It's only been in um, since 1998, since the American Psychological Association actually viewed it as that. And I think what's important is that we also look, as I mentioned before at the start, about we look at the individual, so we look at the subjective. So um, if um, Sophie is feeling, um, you know, her subjective feelings are feeling happy today, she might be feeling a, a seven or she might be feeling an eight or, or I might be feeling a three or a, a two. You know, that's quite subjective about positive psychology. It's our subjective feelings, our positive emotions or lack of. And then you have kind of thinking about the individual so collectively looking at character strengths and we're going to talk about character strengths as, as an area and then also as an institution as a as a collective so for example what makes indigo volunteers you know as an organization how how does that work what kind of positive psychology behaviors do you bring as a as a as a charity as a business to work together um so it's really interesting how you have all these different connectivities around looking at positive psychology and this is kind of where it sits in relation to what you can call psychology as usual so as i said it started in 1998 by a he's called like the grandfather of positive psychology marty seligman um who's just an absolute brain he's brilliant and he kind of put positive psychology in the sense of everybody has always been focused on psychology from a negative viewpoint it's all and it's always been about the neck up so it's always been seen as pathological it's been about fixing people because something's broken um, it's been about illness there was nothing to talk about positive there was nothing to talk about psychology from a flourishing perspective and from a um a thriving perspective so it kind of sits in the middle of looking at things like personality psychology so personality traits personality profiles what makes an individual clinical counseling clinical therapies um, it, it has very much a social connotation because there's an element around you know our environments and our backgrounds that play into positive psychology, especially within institutions, whether that be at work or school or at university. So it kind of sits there, but it also has a huge part of humanistic psychology. Um, Carl Rogers' work has influenced quite a lot of positive psychology about being person-centered. And this is why for me as a practitioner, it's really important because you know there's some stuff I might talk to you about and you'll be like, actually, Ruth, that's not for me. You know, sometimes I work with a client coach and they'll be like, I, I can't get on with that and that's okay because everybody's different and this is what I think when we look at clinical psychology um, it often makes it quite difficult to understand because you know if I've got panic disorder as a diagnosis and somebody else has panic disorder we're not textbook the same you know that there's going to be very different factors that play in how my symptoms play out or my treatment and my recovery is going to be very different from the next person and that's what I love about humanistic psychology um, psychiatry plays a part in it of course sociology um, and which is very true the social and the um, sociology and social psychologies are really important as you can appreciate for those people who are in um, your refugee camps you know they're they're hugely influenced by uh, sociology and the social factors in that sense and biology so there is a part of us that we can play into around our genes but also um, how we look after our bodies um, and and the the psychosomatic link between you know the brain and the body as well often it's what's going off in the body that can cause low flourishing and languishing and the same if something's going off in our minds that can affect our body so and often it's those signs we pick up on first that something's not quite right so this is kind of where it sits and 
it's it kind of hopefully will just move into one form of psychology and maybe that will be in my lifetime maybe not but it's starting to get a lot more uh, a lot more respect um, in terms of the other disciplines as well and this is kind of how it sits into um, kind of general mental health illness and, and psychiatry and this is actually um, it's a continuum and it was designed by a positive psychologist called Corey Keyes. It's actually used, I'm a mental health first aid instructor. It's actually used as part of that to help people to understand not everyone with mental ill health condition is sad and uh, languishing and, you know, unwell all the time. And the same as that somebody who is, um, who doesn't have a mental illness isn't happy all the time okay that's because of how life is but we've always seen a very clean cut distinction between no diagnosis through to a severe diagnosis um so if you look at this we call it mental wealth at champs as well because we like to take the concept of mental health and well-being fuse them together and actually it does take investment you know we have so much that is um given to us genetics and our own environment but actually there's a big part of stuff we need to take accountability and responsibility for ourselves um, and so that's why we call it mental wealth at Shams. So there's a couple of myth busts on this which is what I love and that is because it starts this vertical axis is when somebody's flourishing at the top to languishing and then you've got on the um, the east to west um, axes, no diagnosis to a severe diagnosis. And of course, this isn't um, clear cut and not everyone sits neatly in a full box. I appreciate that. And there's no scale. So I guess severe diagnosis would be somebody who has a long term medication, somebody who um, uh, it has repeated stays in hospitals, um, care, you know, who needs support, all these, you know, those sorts of factors. So there's two there's two boxes I want to miss us because I'm sure we can recognize a person with optimal mental health with no mental illness or disorder and I'm sure we recognize a person with a diagnosis of a mental illness who has poor mental health that bottom that bottom left but these two are the ones that myth bust that a person can have no diagnosis of mental illness or disorder but who has poor mental health you know they're languishing um you know we've seen that lots in during the pandemic where people who've never experienced any form of anxiety have suddenly been in this state of fight and fly um we're going through a collective trauma people are experiencing that differently it doesn't mean they're going to be you know um signed off for clinical depression it doesn't mean they're diagnosed with panic disorder or generalized anxiety disorder or agoraphobia or etc etc but if people aren't careful when they get to this point if they start to slide down it's about actually lifting themselves up and that's why I asked about your you know where you're at one to ten because I know for me if I get to my average is seven if so if I get to a six I have to think about Ruth you need to start doing a little bit of work and I've been doing this for five years now every day writing it down where I'm at because it helps my team um, my clinical team to help me with that so you know once you start falling down here that's when you might need to do some sports or go for a walk in nature or you know cook something or do something you know whatever the self-care is but also this is really important um, that a person can have a diagnosis of a serious mental illness but who can cope well and has positive mental health so I've been quite honest with you guys actually today I've been very honest um, as, as always um, and I'm definitely in the top left today but believe me like everybody else I, I've slipped over the last few weeks so at certain points it's just wrecking and when you're when you're self-aware enough to do that it, it can be quite painful but actually you're able to react quicker and go oh right and it, it doesn't mean you you don't this doesn't happen it just means you you're much more aware of how much hard work that takes but also you're a bit more you're can hopefully be a bit more kinder to yourself to know you you know it's okay to be down here but what what you're going to do about it to kind of work yourself back up so this is what I loved about Corey Keyes's work is that you can have a serious diagnosis of mental ill health but you can be flourishing and the same as you don't have to be diagnosed but it's the idea is that during the pandemic we have seen a lot of people which is why these two white arrows are on this drop down but hopefully this is a 
a neat way of being able to, if people talk to you about mental ill health, you can actually use this four box model and say, no, just because somebody, you know, is down here doesn't mean they're automatically in diagnosis. And just because somebody does have a label, if you want to call it that, um, you know, it means that it, it doesn't label them, it doesn't pigeonhole and, and it shouldn't stereotype them either. So that's, that's kind of the linking in the, the psychiatry part. So when it comes to being authentically happy and being able to stay at the top half of that continuum, Martin Seligman, who is the founding father I mentioned of um, positive psychology, he wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. Um, if you want, if you're interested in this, I'd start. That's a good book to start with. Um, it's been around since oh, 2002. Um, I have a copy somewhere, but just not on my desk at the moment. Um, and it's um, he talks about the three stages of authentic happiness, the kind of the, the link between your mission and your motivation. And I love this because I think it just describes us as humans because, of course, we want a pleasurable life. And I think it's important to recognize we don't want to, you know, we might not want to be um, hedonists constantly, but, you know, it's it's good to have those successes. It's good to feel those positive emotions. It's important to us to have, you know, that very much that pleasurable life um, to kind of build on that. I'm going to talk about building on positive emotions next. Um, but also to have that engaged life and you know you talked about those different elements when you feel in flow and imagine if you didn't have those you know if you had pleasure you know you've got a nice catch-up maybe you had a social distance catch-up with family or friends at the weekend which was nice but actually um, you might have done something that might have boosted you short term but actually how is that engaged the engagement even lower like how do you kind of build on that so being in flow being engaged and also well-being we're going to look at well-being as well and then finally a meaningful life and you work for a charitable organization you know it's probably very different to me sitting talk you know I showed this slide to a law firm last week we did a whole session on authenticity and what it means to have a, a meaningful life um, and some of those may feel like they're having a meaningful life and that's that's good you know but actually when we're providing service to something higher than the self and I think you know if you work in the sector you do you choose to work in that sector um, it's a big part of who you are I'm sure um, but it does perhaps it might just give you an opportunity just to tap in to think about why you've chosen to work and do the work that you do I think that's always interesting to kind of to, to reflect on some of that um, so Martin Seligman says you know these are the different levels and I guess many many people don't get to have a meaningful life which is quite sad because they may not feel that maybe if they have children that's that might be different I don't have children so I can't I don't know how that must feel but I can imagine that probably does feel very mean you know that will feel very meaningful but how do you kind of bring that depth into to what you're doing um so he talks about this and it's it's something that he kind of has has um, focus through positive psychology and he, on this side here we talk about positive emotions and this was the groundbreaking work by Barbara Fredrickson um, and I've heard her speak before last year in uh, a conference um, and she's incredible in terms of the work that she's done around this idea of broaden and build theory and we can experience these positive emotions here for example, gratitude, interest, hope, um, inspiration, love. And the idea is we need to have those positive emotions because we need to experience them, which then they enable us to broaden momentary thought action repertoire. So they kind of, we, we bank them, if you like, and they help us to build enduring personal resources. So if you have felt, um, I don't know, joy before, and you've experienced joy and that moment that you have you kind of log that away and that feeling but what that does is it not only broadens our ability um, to experience that emotion we know what that joy feels like but we're also enabled to pull on it to use that positive emotion when things are more difficult so it lifts us up a bit more. So the more we experience, you know, love and gratitude and, and hope, the more we can bank those and it enables us to transform and it kind of produces this upward spiral. So, you know, if, if 
if you can imagine somebody who's never experienced any positive emotion, then they're they're not going to be that broadened character. They're not going to have those resources to pull on um, because they won't have those um, thought action repertoires. They won't be linked. So the more we can experience positive emotions, which is, I think, which is so lovely when I asked you where you feel flow is when we experience joy and we experience inspiration or we take pride in something and it can be the smallest things and and often when we think of these we think of big declarations and but actually they don't have to be big for us to actually experience them and to be able to tuck them away and um, I think that is really important um, to remember as a runner I went throughout my local park which is not only 10 minutes from me um, not last week, the week before, and there was a perfect moment. I happened to look up, and it was just beautiful. The, the, the leaves, the, the breeze, the sunlight. It was early morning, and I kind of banked that memory, like that picture memory. But it was just also what I felt, and I used it a lot last week. I kept coming back into it when I was going through quite a tough week with mental health awareness week. Um, just really using that. So I think it's really important to recognise when we connect in with those positive emotions and how they make us feel, but we're able to pull on those when we really really need them as well and they help to shape us so you're probably wondering where well-being sits in all of this and um, let me just go back to that previous slide so um, we talk about it here under an engaged life and lots of the activities as well that you've spoke about fit into kind of this area here so this is taken from we call it clean at champs because we make everything into a acronym because it's just easier for us to remember and we just like to um but I like the fact of being clean with well-being. But it's actually taken from the new economics foundation, the five ways of well-being, um, which was published in the in the UK back in the 90s. Evidence base, and this is kind of well known now research about the, these are kind of five pillars that you can encourage positive well-being. So connection, learning, exercise, acts of kindness and notice. And I love this because they're all very simple. And, you know, if I take Simon's example of sports in general, this is a really good one. So sports is a great one to be able to establish well-being because you're connecting usually with a team. You might be learning new skills. You're doing some exercise. Um, acts of kindness so you could perhaps do something for your team but is but also you know it's an act of kindness some self-care for yourself because we forget acts of kindness can be for us too and notice because you're very much present and notice is about being mindful so sports is a great one for all of those um, but some of them you know just I think even you know walking in nature that's an act of kindness exercise and notice and maybe even connect if you want to think about that so what Sophie said um, so there's different ways you can look at this and, and as, a, as a team one thing might be a nice way to be able to do this is use this as a, as a tool to create challenges or ideas so we do this a lot with organizations that we work with around um, some sort of their well-being champions how they can encourage areas of this and exercise can be a walk it doesn't have to be a team sport the same acts of kindness can you know you guys are, are working for a charity but actually what small acts of kindness can you do for each other or for yourself as well last week's mental health awareness week in the uk was kindness uh, themed and we did a lot of work around actually kindness for yourself around things like mindful drinking and sleeping and all sorts of, of things that actually are really important for us. And then notice doesn't have to be cross-legged, set or zen at all. Some of you are yogis, which is great. I am too, which is a lovely way to kind of get, kind of feel in the body and just observe how your mind and body are but actually um you know just unplugging from your tech going for a walk without your phone um listening to a meditative story doing some yoga nidra like which is basically lying down sleep yoga you know there's hundreds of different ways being more aware when you brush your teeth for two minutes loads of different ways you can be more mindful and so it's a good 
while we're still in this current situation as well, um, you know, how you can protect yourself from feeling lonely or isolated, but also it's around encouragement of staying healthy, productive and vibrant. So positive psychology links into that concept of well-being because you're engaging with others, you're engaging with yourself. Um, so it's subjective, it's individual, it's collective and it's about the present. But you can also, you know, work towards goals with this. So that's how well-being sorts of fits in with um, with positive psychology. And then thinking about the individual, I thought this might be really interesting because it's something you can go off and do um, is to think about from an individual perspective of positive psychology. Um, there's a big piece of work on character strengths. It's something that I use a lot as a uh, coach and positive psychology practitioner. And what I love about it is it's not the same as skills, they're more trait-like. And the idea is that strengths are basic human characteristics and everybody has them. So it's not a a personality profile, um, you're not taught you're this personality type or you're this. It's basically your values in action. So it's traits that are aligned with your core beliefs. So going back to um, Marty Seligman's work here, where are we? Thinking about meaningful life you know, what are your values in action? What are your core beliefs? Because that kind of starts to dig into a more meaningful life. So we're kind of on that last phase now of the, of the meaningful life. And the idea is these are our greatest areas of potential for excellence because what are our greatest strengths? And I, I always think with this, um, how the strengths work is Hello, sorry, I don't know what happened there. I'm back in. Can everybody can everybody hear me? Can I just check? I don't know what happened there. Can someone just message in the group so you can hear me? Hello? Yep, yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Just completely connected out. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, that happened last week as well. It seems to be around this time, whether it's people logging in, sorry. So um, I like the idea of these because um, strengths are good um, to think about. The ones we pull on a lot, actually um, the ones we don't pull on, why don't we pull on them? And actually an overused strength could become a weakness. And this is what I think is um, a good idea with this. And these can be used as an individual organization. So let me show you what it looks like. It's called the values in action. And you can log on here, the via character.org forward slash character strengths. Um, it was created by Marty Seligman. It's completely free. OK, and what they did was they researched over three millennia worth of religions and philosophical teachings. And they came up with these six um, areas and within those uh, six sets of traits, they've um, they've got different uh, strengths and there's 24 of them in total. And what you do is you go online. It's a free survey. It takes about 15, 10, 15 minutes to complete, it's 240 lines, um, and then you get your PDF report. And all of these are on that report, and they'll be in an order. And they change because the idea with positive psychology, if we look at it from a humanistic perspective, is that life changes. So when I did this two years ago, the middle ones pretty much stayed the same, but there was a definite switch at some of the, the top and some at the bottom and I think it's really interesting to look at the fifth the five top are kind of known as your top character strengths but I always ask people when I work with them to to look at the bottom ones because often it's like well why don't I pull on um for example why don't I pull on humor a lot you know is that why isn't why don't I feel comfortable doing that but the idea is for example if I had leadership which I do as one of my top strengths if I'm always being the leader, or I feel compelled to be the leader, then sometimes that not only, you know, doesn't allow anybody else to be to take the role of leader, but actually it might be that I feel that I have to, it might mean that I constantly get burnt out, rather than being able to step back. So it's always interesting to think about what the difference is um, when you overuse your strength. So just have a look at those um, 24 strengths, which one resonates to you? J just quickly put in the chat, which one do you think, oh, yeah, that really resonates with me? There's, there's, and of course, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm just interested to 
see what your thoughts are. What immediately jumps out? Anything as a strength that you you kind of identify with? Gratitude. Yeah. Anyone else? Love of learning, open mindness. Love of learning is one of my one of my Nikki, definitely. Love of learning and curiosity and leadership. They're my top three. Curiosity, yeah. If you really think curiosity, courage. Megan, lovely, integrity and curiosity. So this is another nice way. You, you can actually, there's cards sometimes I use as well as a um, a coach. And I actually just ask people to pick their first, you know, five that resonate. Um, and when we talk through those, um, I think it's quite interesting. It's just a different way of, because the idea is these are your values. If these kind of linked into your core beliefs as well, like if you're in a, you know, an organization or you're doing a role or in your life, you're not being able to be courageous enough or you're not able to be curious, then how does how do you bring that into your day or where do you get that from in your life? Um, so I think it's um, it's a really interesting one to go and have a look at. And if you're if you know, if this is an area again, it's totally free. Don't pay for any reports. You can just basically go down to the bottom once you get your results online and you can um, you can just print off the PDF. But it's an interesting one to look at, especially as, as colleagues. You know, if you're in teams and you want to be able to to look at that, it's a nice thing to do as a team as well, because um, I guess you don't want everybody being a leader all the time. You need a bit of a mix. Um, so that's that's a good way for you to just to start for you personally to delve into your own meaning and purpose and your values because it's not often something we go around thinking about our own values and and how are, you know how are we executing am I being meaningful today it's not often on our to-do list so it's a, it's a nice way to kind of think about that so positive psychology intervention is going to wrap up in the last 15 minutes now about positive psychology interventions because um, we've already given you one which was the VIA the values and action character strength it does sound a bit medical interventions um but it's not so the ppis or positive psychology development you could call it self-development carol dweck is a big um a, a big professor in this field as well um you might have seen her book grit she's done a famous ted talk on this as well but she talks about the growth mindset which is the view that you adopt for yourself profoundly affects the way you lead your life. And that's a lot of what we've just been talking about. Um, so she also came up with this um, quote, sorry, formula, passion plus perseverance times long term goals equals grit. And I think that's really important. We look at our values in action. You know, if we're being passionate about our values, um, if we're being passionate about the work that we're doing and we create that perseverance, that it enables us then to, to we, we have some grit, you know, we talk about having achieved those goals. And I, I also mentioned about so under the social um, and um, the sociology and social psychology elements is this whole part about, you know, 50% of our happiness levels may be determined by our genes and 10% by circumstances. So this is what the kind of the uh, the formula is we still have this 40% really that we can work with, which is why I talked about mental wealth and investing in ourselves um, is really important and it's a journey and it's very cliche, but it's true and that constantly changes. And I think we forget, you know, we. I saw a, a quote, someone posted something on Instagram not long ago, which talked about self-development and they were sort of saying the bugger, <laughs> the thing about social, um, thing about self-development is you get to a point, you get to a point where you feel, you know, you've done all this work and then life changes and happens and you have to start all over again. And and that is what I was talking about with the red, the red pill, because this is never ending, you know, as we grow older and age and life changes and we go through different experiences, we always need to be changing and growing with that, which is, that kind of growth mindset and how we view ourselves and the way that we lead our life is a big part of that. There's about 63 scientific evidence-based empirical research uh, positive psychology interventions. I've, I've 
talked about the signature strengths, which is a really good one. For those of you who are yogis, you'll already be doing kind of some form of meditation, but those of you like, you know, acts, um, noticing, game for, you know, walking meditation, anything that's around kind of connecting in with how you're feeling and checking in and focusing on the breath is really important. So that's a good, that's a good one. Um, I'm going to talk to you about gratitude. Journaling is a really uh, is proven. I did a whole piece of research on um, writing, um, expressive writing intervention. So if you're into journaling, that's a good one. Savoring, so savoring a moment, savoring a meal, not being on your phone, not being on social. There's different savoring interventions and acts of kindness. So acts of kindness for yourself and for others. Um, so I'm going to just talk you through one for gratitude, which is so, so simple, but it's proven to be one of the most effective positive psychology interventions. So it's the most powerful and it's the most well studied of PPIs and it's the simplest. And all it is, is every night before going to sleep, write down three things that went well that day. And that is all you have to do. And this is proven to increase happiness and decrease depressive symptoms for at least three to six months. Um, I've been doing this one for a little while. I have it as a little thing to do now before I get to sleep. And you don't have to write, I don't always write it down, to be honest. I just think of it in my head, like what three things have gone well today. And they don't have to be big. I think as well, we set ourselves up for big things, but it could be, I really enjoyed my dinner tonight. I made a really lovely dinner or um, I had a really nice uh, smile off the neighbor as I went out and put the bit you know the rubbish out or whatever it is you know what they don't have to be big but this is it I think especially at the moment um, the more simple the more effective the more you know tiny interventions that kind of just help build that positivity but also we start to see the good in even the smallest of things so this is proven um this isn't made up and there's various spins of this that have happened where i've seen organizations run it especially in parts of europe um which have, again have proven like performance and productivity so maybe something to try so I've given you a couple there of little ones that you can take away with you. So there's quite a lot that I've just covered in the last um, the last uh, 50 minutes, 58, 58, 52 minutes or so. Um, does anyone have any questions? You can either speak or you can just drop something into the chat. Is there any questions that you might have around anything that I've spoken about? There's my details there as well. And you can actually drop me a mail at support at shampsconsult.com. Do follow us on social. Um, and I'm on social as well on Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. So you can also follow me. Is there any questions that anyone has following the session? I'll bring back up the via in case you didn't. You missed that because that's definitely one to do that there so do jot that down any questions or was that mind-blowing enough for you <laughs> oh oh no worries megan thank you thanks for having me Always a pleasure to support you guys. I hope you find it useful. I hope there's lots of little nuggets of, of information there for you to um, take away. Um, so do reach out to us um, if there's anything, any questions that you might have, or if you need any further information, you know where to find me. But it's an absolute, honestly, it's a nice way to come back after the bank holiday. I was actually really looking forward to this this afternoon. <laughs> oh, you're very kind. You've got the character strength link up. Oh, extra, extra brownie points for you, <laughs> Genevieve. Lovely. Okay, guys. Well, on that note, I'll let you carry on with the rest of your early evenings or if it sticks where you are um, as you head into the evening. So... Take care and uh, all the best. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you, guys. Take care. Oh, good. Thanks, Megan. Lo lovely to work with you guys again.